Welcome to First Baptist Church. You're listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead. Please check us out on the internet at fbcboron.org. First Timothy <clears throat> chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, in the word of the Sovereign Lord reads, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. This is the word of the Lord. The late R.C. Sproul once wrote, We need the church as urgently as a starving baby needs his mother's milk. And I would agree. I think he's completely right. Because I know I need the church. I desperately need the church. And I know that you need the church. And our community and our families desperately need the church. In fact, the entire world needs the church. And the reason why the world needs the church is because the world needs Jesus. The world desperately needs the hope that can only come from Christ. Because the hope of the world is not more money. The hope of the world is not more human acceptance. The hope of the world is not the numbing of of the pain that we feel. The hope of the world is not even a lack of conflict in our lives. The hope of the world is not having enough resources to retire on. The hope of the world is not even who wins the elections. The hope of the world is none other but Jesus Christ because what the world needs more than anything else, what the world needs more than anything else is salvation from sin and from the wrath of God as a result of sin, the wrath of a holy and righteous and just God. And the word and, and the world needs What it needs more than anything else is it needs forgiveness. And that's only available to us through faith and the risen Christ Jesus and his finished work on the cross. The world desperately, desperately, desperately needs Jesus Christ. And because of that, the world desperately needs the church. And because of that, Because of that, the church's mission is ongoing. Now, some of you might say, I don't really even see the connection there. I mean, I would agree. I would understand that that the world needs Jesus, but I don't understand why you say the world needs a church. I mean, I don't see how those things go hand to hand. And the answer is quite simple. God ordained, the God ordained instrument that he is using to bring Christ and the gospel to the world is, in fact, the church. The way that God is bringing life, the life-saving message of, of the truth of Christ to all the nations is the church. God has ordained for the church to be the instrument that protects, preserves, and proclaims the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul says, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if, you, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. You see, actually, it's better said that it is the pillar and buttress of the truth. The Greek actually specifies that, not so much a pillar, but it is the pillar. The church is God's instrument that he has created by his own hand to proclaim the gospel to the lost and then to bring them into fellowship as a family and then to train them up for service so they can actually join that mission. In fact, that is exactly what we see in Matthew chapter 28 when when Jesus gives the Great Commission. He says this, he goes, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. What we see in the Great Commission is the mandate of the church by God himself. Jesus, with all authority, says to go. Well, who is it that's supposed to go? Who is he calling to go out? His followers, his church. They are to go. And when they go, what are they to do? Well, according to this text, they're to do three things. 
Number one, they are to go make disciples, which means they are to go out and share the hope of Christ with other people and help them come to faith in Christ. Or in other words, evangelize the lost. The church's first and primary task is evangelism. We are to go out into the world and tell people about Jesus Christ. The second task of the church, once a person is a believer, is to baptize them into the church. Or in other words, to integrate them into the body of Christ. Because that's the purpose of baptism. It is a public declaration that a person has come to faith in Jesus Christ. It's the image of a person's death to their old nature and new life in Jesus Christ. And it is also the requirement for membership into the church. Baptism is the symbol of becoming part of the body of Christ, both universally and locally. And believe me, it is God's plan and pattern that all who come to faith in Him, all who come to faith in Him, all who come to faith in Him become integrated into the body of Christ and become part of the church. And then the third part of the mandate is that this person is to be trained up for service. Jesus said that we need to teach them to observe all the things that I've commanded you. Explicit in Jesus' instructions here is, is training and equipping people for service. This is what we call discipleship. And the reason for this is now they can go do what we have been called to do, which is to go out and evangelize the lost, integrate them into the church, and train them up for the service. By the way, this is what God's plan is for the world. This is God's plan in how he's redeeming the lost throughout the world. That is that we, the church, go into all the world, make disciples of everyone that we can, help them to get plugged into a local church so they can be trained up and go out and do the same thing, which is to go out and evangelize and integrate and help people to get trained to do the same thing. And on and on and on it goes. In fact, that's been the pattern since the very beginning. This is God's plan to change the world. This is God's plan to bring salvation to his people. This is how he's ordained for the nations to hear about the gospel. It is through the faithful work of the church. Yes, individuals do go out on their own into the world. But they are trained by the church. They are sent by the church. They are accountable to the church, and they themselves are even a part of the church because they are a part of the body of Christ. So God's plan to change the world and to reach the lost is not a bunch of scattered individuals doing their own thing. It is the united effort of God's family, the church. That is why the world needs a church. The world needs Christ, and the God-ordained instrument is the church to bring him to them. Those who know Christ know him because, why? Because of the church. The church that goes all the way back to the very beginning. And that's why we all need the church. Now, there are many other reasons why we all individually and personally need the church. Like love and support and fellowship and belonging, sharing each other's burdens We need to pray for each other, right? In fact, I personally need your prayers. I mean, I have things in my own life that I battle with, that I'm dealing with, that are very taxing emotionally. I need your prayers. You want to pray for somebody, pray for me. right? Right? And I'm sure that you the same way. We need to pray for each other. right? We need each other personally as a church for sure. Right? And, and, we could, and I probably should do a whole sermon series just on that alone. But all of those things are really beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about over the next three weeks. Because over the next three weeks, as we're starting this new year, we're going to get really kind of big picture about the church. We're going to, we're going to talk about what the church really is, as God has intended for it to be. And we're going to talk about what the church is meant to do, as God has intended for it to do. Because let's just face it, right? We live in a time where where a lot of people simply just get this thing wrong. They get what church is wrong. They get what the church is supposed to do wrong. We live in a time right now, right, at a point in history where there's just a lot of different ideas about what the church is meant to do. Right? We live at a time when most people have heard the word church, and most people have some ideas about what the church is, and they even have an image of in their own head of what it looks like to them. And for some people, that is accurate, but for most of them, it's not. In fact, some people believe that the church 
Some people believe that the church is an activist organization that is meant to bring about social change into the world. That the church is about social justice. And they think about the activists who use the pulpit to drive a political agenda. Now understand, while the church certainly should be interested in bringing you know, hope to people who are downtrodden and meeting people's needs and standing up for those who can't stand up for themselves, the church is not an activist organization and social justice is not the church's mission. Some people believe that the church is primarily a community of people who just huddle together doing life together. People who just support each other and help each other and encourage each other and meet each, other, each other's needs. And again, please hear me. The church should do those things. We should always be interested in edifying one another and in love. And the church is certainly a community of believers who have a common interest, which is Christ, and a group of people who take care of each other. But the church is not just a community. And helping each other is not, though it's important, is not the church's primary mission. And for other people, the church is this self-help kind of clinic. And the point of the church is to make us better people. People come to church because they want to grow and be better and more moral. And they want to, they want to just be more fulfilled. And, and, and while the church certainly is a place to grow... And we want to help people to learn to follow Christ and become obedient to the Word of God. The church is not a self help organization. And it is not about becoming a better, more moral version of you. Self improvement is not the mission of the church. The mission of the church is something else. The church is something altogether different than those things. In fact, again, look with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Timothy says, I mean, Paul says to Timothy, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. We see in this text right here that the church is not an organization like a business or a club. Right? It is a household. And it is the household of the living God. And this is important. This right here is important for us to keep in mind because if it's the household of the living God, that means the church belongs to Him. It's His. Which means it ain't yours. It's not ours. Right? It does not belong to us. Right? It is not our household. Right? And this is something we need to understand. In the Old Testament and in Jesus' time, this was probably a little bit more, you know, a little bit more clear when you said somebody's household, right? They knew whose ownership that meant. This is his household, which, right? He is the master of his household, which means he is the one who directs it. He is the one who gives it purpose. He is the one who, who says how things go. What he says is law, not what we say. And so as we, we think, and so what we think and feel about the church personally and what the church is, and what the church should do, those things are really irrelevant in light of what God actually has to say. It is his church, his household. And the church is to be lived in and operated according to what, what he says, not simply by what we think and feel, which means our understanding of the church, and how we conduct the church, and how we worship in the church, and how we live our lives as part of the church, is to be centered and focused on him. All of our understanding of the church needs to be God-centered rather than man-centered and focused on us. Because, because the church exists for his glory, not mine. The church exists for his purposes, not our purposes. It belongs to him. And notice that the church, it says that it's a household. This is, again, important because Paul does not say that it's the house of the Lord. It's not the building of the Lord. He said it's the household. You see, the church is not a building. It's not. We, I mean, the building that we're in right now, it is not the church. We might call it the church, right? But this is not the church. It's the church's building. The room that we're in is the church's sanctuary. The property we're on is the church's property, but itself, it is not the church. The church is not a building. It is not a location. The church is not a place to go. The church is the household of God. In other words, 
In other words, the church is the family of God. Because that's what a household is, right? A household is a family. When, when the Bible talks about the household of David, it's not talking about the place that he lived. It talked about his family. And what we need to keep in mind here is the fact that, that this is God's family. And it doesn't belong to us. We belong to it. We belong to it. We belong to his family. It is his family. And if you're someone who's been saved by the grace of God through faith, then you are part of that family. We become children of God and his family. Remember, we talked quite a bit last week about adoption in our sermon series, I mean, I mean our sermon uh, related to Christmas. When God saves you, not, he's not, you don't simply just exist now as an enemy he has a peace treaty with. Right? You become one of his family members. You become one of his children. We are adopted into his family. We become children. We are given the right to call out to him, Abba, Father. This is one of the greatest truths in the Christian faith. Not only does he save you from the penalty of your sin and the power of your sin, and one day promised to save you from the presence of sin, he then takes you, the enemy, the rebel against God, and brings you home and puts the robe and the ring on you and puts the shoes on your feet and celebrates and says, my son is home. You become one of his children who can come to him for anything. When we trust in Christ, we become part of the household of God. The church is his household. So with that, then, the church is not an activist organization. The church is not simply just a community of people who gather together. And it's not some self-improvement therapy group. The church is the family of God that is made up of the believers who trust in him. But I want you to also notice what Paul says next. okay? Because what the church is, is the family of God. Paul's going to tell us what the church does. The church is the pillar and the buttress of the truth. The family of God is the support and the foundation of the truth. And what truth is he talking about? He's talking about the life-saving, eternity-shaping truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the truth he's talking about. And Paul says that the church is the pillar and foundation of that truth. And what we need to understand is that in this verse, what Paul is doing is he's leveraging the image of the temple Diana found in Ephesus. This letter was written to Timothy, who was pastoring a church in Ephesus. And there was this great big temple to Diana that was called, it was one of the seven wonders of the world. It's one of the most beautiful structures that existed at the time. Right? It's this gigantic, glorious roof structure that has all kinds of ornate carvings and artwork on it. And, it's, and all of this beautiful wonder to behold is held up and, and lifted up for all to see on pillars, all of which that rest on the foundation of stone. And Paul, using this architectural imagery, what he's saying is that the church is the foundation and the supports to this glorious edifice called the gospel, God's truth. The church is the foundation and the pillars that hold up and support God's life-saving truth of the gospel for all the world to see. It's through the church that the gospel will be lifted up high for the world to see. It is through the church that the world would experience and see the truth of of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is painting here. The church is the God-chosen instrument to support and to display God's glorious, life-saving truth of the gospel of Christ. In other words... The church is God's family, defending and declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the church is, and that's what the church does. It is God's family, the believers in Christ, defending and protecting the truth of the gospel from decay, and displaying and declaring the truth of the gospel for the entire world to see. So the church is not simply a gathering of like-minded people, who want to accomplish a political agenda, as we see as many people on the left and many people on the right. It is not a community of people who are simply together so they can affirm each other's identity, even though some people's identity is sinful, according to Scripture. 
And the church is not some self-improvement group where you become a better version of you, you know, 2.0 you. The church is God's family defending and displaying the truth. It is God's children under his leadership protecting and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the church is God's chosen instrument to bring the hope of Christ to the rest of the world. That is what the church is, God's family. And that's what the church does, protect and proclaim the gospel. Now that we know that, we're going to take the next three weeks and talk about some things that we need to get right. If we're going to fulfill the mission and the purpose of the church that God is calling us to. If we, the family of God, are going to do what God is calling us to do, there are some things that we absolutely need to make sure that we're clear on and that we need to get right. And there are three things that we're going to focus on. Three essential components that we find that that Paul discusses at great length in his pastoral letters written uh, to to Timothy and Titus. That's 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. What you need to understand is is Paul nearly, he wrote nearly two-thirds of the New Testament. Right, two thirds of the New Testament that we have is written by Paul, right? And, and and all of it is written in letter form. It is not just some simple just book. He writes letters to people, and most of those letters are written to churches in certain areas that address certain political, excuse me, theological and practical issues. But Paul also then writes these three letters not to churches but to individuals, to pastors. That's why they're called the pastoral uh, epistles. And these pastors were Timothy and Titus, two young, very talented, ordained pastors. And Paul wrote these letters in order to instruct these young men in how the church is to be organized, how the church is to be taught, and how the church is to be led. And what we, what we see in these letters is a focus on these three essential elements, three things that the church must absolutely get right if, they're, if we're going to do what God's calling us to do. And they are, number one, the truth. The truth of the gospel and God's word. The church must get the truth correct. The church must hold to an orthodox Christian doctrine. Without that, without the truth, the church is lost in just simply a social club. At best. Or a life-threatening cult at worst. The church must get the truth correct. Correct. Secondly, the thing that the church needs to get right is the leadership of the church. Those people who are called to lead the church, the church must absolutely get the leadership right. The church must be led by biblically qualified leaders. Otherwise, again, the church can fall into grave error and become lost. And then the third thing the church needs to get right is the members of the church which is actually a lot more important than you might think initially. The church must get correct who is actually a member of the church and who is not. And so it is about the truth of the church, the leadership of the church, and the members of the church. And again, there's a lot of ground to cover in the next three weeks as we look at these essential things, and we'll take the next couple weeks to do that. Next week, we're going to look at the biblical leadership of the church, what that looks like and what it means for us. And then the week after, we're going to talk about biblical membership of the church and why that's actually very important to all of us. But today, in the time that we have left, we're going to talk about the essential of truth in the church. And the foundation, the absolute foundation of all truth in the church to us is simply the Word of God. The Bible the scriptures handed down to us by the apostles themselves. That is the foundation of all the truth that the church holds to. Without this, there is no objective truth for us to hold to. Do you understand that? Without the word of God, there is nothing for us to hold on to. We might as well just make it up and and do what we want to do. We might as well just create a club that fits our, our personal proclivities. Without this, there is no church. Because the foundation of everything we believe, the foundation of everything that we do, the foundation of all that we are, is the Word of God. And notice what Paul says. He says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching 
for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now, I know that we've covered this before, but, but the expression breathed out by God is from the Greek word theonoustos, which is a word you're probably getting a little bit more familiar with because I say it a lot, and I've even probably had you guys say it a couple times. Theonoustos, which literally means God exhaled. It is the idea that Scripture is the breath of God. How do you speak? You exhale. Right? So this means the Scripture is the Word of God. It's the very voice of God. When you hear the Word being read, you're hearing the voice of God. All Scripture, Old and New Testament, is the very Word of the living God, which means the Word is inerrant and without error. Why? Because God is without error. It's His Word. He's without er error. The Word is without error. Secondly, the Word is infallible, which means it will never fail, and it's always effective. Why? Because our God never fails. Ever. Ever. And third, the word is sufficient, or that it's enough. The word is sufficient because God is sufficient. Right? The word is sufficient to fulfill all the purposes that God has for us and for the church. The word of God is the foundation of truth of the church. It is without error, it is unfailing, and it's enough to show the world the truth of Christ. And because of that, the word of God then is profitable for teaching other people the truth, for reproof, which is identifying the error that some people might hold on to, for correction, which means identifying the error and then teaching them the right way and getting back on the right path, and then for training in righteousness so that we can progressively become more and more obedient to the Word of God. And notice that it says that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The scriptures not only teach us what is right and correct what is wrong, it also helps us to grow towards spiritual maturity so that we can be ready to do the things that God is calling us to do. And you have been with me long enough to know that I've been preaching about this for a long time. God has called every one of you, every one of you, into the mission field. He's called every one of you to do something. The Word of God prepares us as members of the church to fulfill the mission of Christ, which we are all called to be a part of, which is to go out and make disciples and the first place that the church around us at large tends to go wrong is how they begin to view and understand the Bible. Because many organizations that call themselves churches will deny that the Bible is all the Word of God, and because of that, they deny that the Bible is inerrant, infallible, and sufficient. In fact, many so-called churches think that the Scriptures are just simply a collection of ancient wisdom that contain in them some truth, but they're not actually the foundation of truth themselves. And because of that, then, what it means to be a church, and what it means to be saved, and, and what it means to, to have, have a relationship with Christ is simply then, like... Plato in their hands. It's very flexible. And a person's faith is simply something they just shape and mold to fit their own preferences and their own personal feelings. But understand, that is not faith in the living God. That is actually idolatry. They are simply making an idol of the things that they like, and then they worship that. That's why the second important aspect to truth is the doctrine of the church. The doctrines of the church. Which, by the way, I don't know if you noticed, but Paul talks about that a lot in these three letters. In fact, let me just share with you a few of those instances. And you can just kind of follow along. I've given you a couple of those references there, but you'll get the point. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. So I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrines. Because there was an orthodox church set of doctrines. There was teachings in the church that led people to the truth, but then people were teaching something different. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8-11, through 11, just bear with me. 
Now that we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I had been entrusted. Paul makes it clear that there is sound, biblical, true doctrine, and then there's false or different doctrine. He goes on and says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 through 4, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching or sound doctrine, but have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers that suit their own passions. It sounds a lot like America today, right? And will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And then he goes on even in Titus and mentions it. First, in Titus chapter 1, verse 9, but hold, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. And then Titus chapter 2, verse 1, but as for you, teach what accords to sound doctrine. You see, doctrine is an issue that Paul frequently addresses. Doctrine is used to combat false, unbiblical teaching. Because you have, you have sound doctrine, but then you have false doctrine. You have orthodox truth, true doctrine, but then you have what's called heresy or false teaching. There is no in-between, by the way. You see, the word doctrine simply means teaching. And so doctrine is the teachings of the church. It is the body of teaching that has been developed by the church based on what the scriptures themselves teach. Doctrine is what the church actually teaches based on the word of God. And this doctrine or this teaching helps us then to stand firm on the truth of the word of God. You see, not only do we have the word of God to lead us to truth, but we have a historical church Doctrine, an orthodox teaching that comes from the Word of God that helps us understand our faith. It helps us understand who God is. It helps us understand who we are and the nature of the church. And one of the foundational doctrines that we have at First Baptist Church is our doctrine of scriptures. We believe, based on what the Word of God says, that the Bible is inerrant, inspired, infallible, and sufficient in the very Word of God Himself. We derive this doctrine, this teaching, not from our traditions, but from the Word of God itself. And this doctrine helps us to then have a clear view, not a flawed or an untrue view of of God's Word. It helps us to see the Word of God clearly. Our doctrine of the Scriptures, or, or what we teach about the Scriptures, elevates the Word of God to be our final infallible authority in all matters of our faith and life and practice. Our doctrine or view of Scripture is a high view of Scripture. We have a very high view of the Word of God. And the reason why we have a very high view of the Word of God is because we have a very high view of the author of Scripture, God Himself. Our doctrine of God based on, on the Bible says that he is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, and is the sovereign Lord of all things. Our doctrine of God says that he's completely holy and righteous and just, but he's also loving and merciful and gracious and forgiving. We have a very high view, a very lofty view of God. We also have a very high view of Christ. Our doctrine of Christ is, is this, that, that he is the son of the living God, that he is God himself. He is the second member of the Trinity, that he is the incarnate word, and that he's our only hope to salvation. Because he lived the perfect life that you couldn't live, and he died on a cross to pay a penalty that you couldn't pay. And on that cross, he takes your sin and gives to you the righteousness that you didn't earn. And then he died and then was raised three days later, proving that he is what he claimed to be, and that he, pro- that he can do what he promised to do, and that he's conquered sin and death, 
And right now, in this moment, is the right hand of the Father interceding for those who trust in Him. That is our doctrine of Christ. Right? That is a compilation of what the Bible teaches all rolled up in one clear subject. And this doctrine, again, is not based on tradition, but a very careful study of the texts. Our doctrine helps us to see the truth of Scripture and keep it in focus. Like our doctrine of the church. <laughs> that is why we're talking about what we're talking about for the next few weeks. What is the church? What is the purpose of the church? How is the church supposed to live and behave and act in a way that glorifies God? That is all part of our doctrine of church. Right? It's what we teach about the church. And this is something that many people get wrong. That's why some people treat churches as social justice organizations. Or support groups or self-help clubs, or entertainment venues, or ways they rinse themselves. That's why we see churches that ordain unqualified leaders and accept unqualified, unregenerate members. There's a church in Canada that has an atheist as a minister. How far does your doctrine of the church have to get sideways for you to for the, let that to happen? And they, they accepted it. Why would you even want to be there? This is why churches allow unbelievers on the worship team because, because they sing good and play instruments well. This happens quite often in some megachurches. Some megachurches are so consumed with the products of worship music that it has to be so, so expert and skilled that they are hiring professional musicians who are not believers because they play the instruments well. A flawed view of the church is why so many churches think that salvation is about how nice we are to other people and how tolerant we are of lifestyles and, and, and how effective we are engaging the culture around us rather than understanding that salvation is the sovereign work of God himself. That our part simply is to sow the seed, love the people, pray for them and never give up on them. That salvation ultimately is going to be the work of God. These people have a flawed view of the church, and this flawed doctrine of the church leads them to a flawed doctrine of a lot of things, like the church's mission and salvation and even the Great Commission itself. The truth is, is that the truth of the church rests on the doctrine of, of, of the doctrines of the church. The truth of the church rests on the doctrines of the church, which is all founded on the word of God itself. But the truth is also supported by our confession of faith. The truth is supported by, as a church, our confession of faith. Now, another way to say confession is to say creed or statement of faith. Because a confession is an important way to understand and communicate the truth of the church. You see, the Bible is the foundation of the truth. The doctrine is, is, is the comprehensive way of teaching the truth. And a confession is a way of declaring that you believe the truth. Paul tells Timothy in, in his first letter, chapter 6, verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the, the, of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And what you need to understand is this confession that Timothy made is not his confession and his conversion that Paul's talking about, but rather his confession and his ordination to become a church leader. Timothy was declaring as a leader of the church, this is what I believe. These are the things I believe. This is the doctrine that I believe. This is my confession. You see, a confession is how we identify clearly and concisely what it is we really believe. Because it's easy, hear me, it is easy to say, well, I just believe the Bible. I, I just believe what the Bible says, right? Every person who claims to be a Christian says that. Do you understand that? I just believe what the, what the Bible says. I just appeal to the Scriptures. Everybody who says they follow Jesus says, I believe the Bible. I believe what's taught in the Bible, including those people who don't believe that the Bible is inerrant, infallible, sufficient, including people who will deny the divinity of Jesus Christ and say that he's not God, including people who are not even Christians in the historic sense, like Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and Oneness Pentecostals. They will all say the same thing. 
They will look you in the eye and say to you, I believe what the Bible actually teaches. But they don't actually believe the historic Orthodox teachings of the Christian church. Confessions and creeds and statements of faith cut right to the clutter and help to give clarity to the essential issues. What is it that makes a Christian a Christian? It's like the Apostles' Creed. I'm sure that you've heard the Apostles' Creed. You might not realize that you have, but when I read these words, you'll go, hey, I've heard that before. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. That is the Apostles' Creed. One of the earliest creeds, not the earliest, but one of the earliest creeds formulated to express what we sincerely believe when we say that we're a Christian. By the way, I don't know if you realize that, but when you've probably heard me recite most of that, every time I, rec- I recite the gospel in just about every sermon that I preach, the Apostles' Creed gets right at the heart of the matter of important issues like what we believe about who God is and, and what Christ has done and the nature of the gospel. The Apostles' Creed clarifies what a person believes, as does the Nicene Creed and the Athanasian Creed, which are statements developed to clarify important doctrinal issues over time, like the divinity of Christ and the Trinity. And if someone was to say, I don't believe any of those things, then you have the right to say, then you're not a Christian. It's as simple as that. Because if you don't believe those things, then you don't believe the things that the Bible says about about what it means to be a Christian. You're not a follower of Christ if you don't believe those things. Those creeds spell out the things that make believers believers. And if a church says, we don't believe those things, we don't teach those things, then you don't don't have a church. You have something altogether different. Creeds act as a clear dividing line between what is true and what is untrue. They divide between believers and unbelievers. They divide between churches and cults. Now, today in our modern context of, of of, of inclusivism, many people will complain, well, creeds and confessions you know, and doctrines divide the church. No, they don't. No. The church has no business having unity with, with untruth. Right? It, it does not divide the church. It divides what is untrue from true. It gives us a clear picture whether or not a person may or may not be a real believer or whether or not a church is really even a church. Confessions highlight the important issues and give the church clarity. And they also act as a protective barrier. They protect the church from accepting believers as members who have a say in how the church is ran. You see, everybody is welcome here. I want you to hear that. That big word on the sign outside is not First Baptist Church. The big word out there says welcome. Everyone's welcome here. Everyone's welcome here. Believers and unbelievers alike. Everyone can come here and sit and listen and, 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 and worship with us. Believers and unbelievers alike. But only believers can be members of this church. Why? Because as a believer, you have a voice in the church government here, especially, especially in how some certain things are run. Believers have a vote in who is hired as the pastor of this church and how we adopt the budget and how the money gets spent here. Churches must see to it that anyone that has any influence in the church, in the direction of the church, that they must be true believers under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, the church will soon fall off the rails. In fact, the reason why Paul, just for you, so you know, first, for, for, for context reasons, the reason why Paul sent Timothy to Ephesus, and the reason why he wrote 1 Timothy, is because the church in Ephesus was in a, was, was in a mess, its church membership began to become corrupt, and then they begin to ordain and put into place unqualified leadership who then begin to teach false doctrine, and that led to, to a continual outpouring of behavioral issues inside the church and outside the church. The church was literally falling apart from within. 
That's why he wrote the letter. Creeds and confessions and, and statements of faith are a form of protection so that those who influence the church are, are a higher likelihood to be believers. Because ultimately, we don't get to judge that. God does. But we can say, is this what you believe? That, by the way, is why we have a statement of faith here at First Baptist Church. To be a member of this church, a person must read, agree to the 2000 Baptist Faith and Message. It's not very complicated. It's very simple to read. It's not very like detailed in, in the sense of like too deep theologically, right? But it clearly explains what we believe about core issues and what we teach here. And, and everything, it talks about everything from Scripture to the Trinity to sin to the salvation and even to the family itself. Anyone who wants to be a member of this church must agree with the statement of faith. That is how we protect the church here. And anyone who wants to serve in the church, especially in leadership or, or in a teaching capacity or in a capacity that involves children or teenagers, must be a member of this church that fully agrees with the statement of faith. In fact, we're going to talk more about that in a couple of weeks. But the statement of faith that we have here, right, and, and, and confessions and, and creeds are their dividing lines between truth and untruth. They form a protective barrier inside the church, but they are also then a track to run on as we want to grow more and more in our faith. I don't know if you realize it, but creeds and confessions and statements of faith have been the instruments that the church has been using as an outline to teach doctrine by for centuries. Right? The statement of faith is a great way to, uh, to disciple other people because if you lead somebody through the statement of faith and they learn that, they have a pretty good handle about what, the, what Christianity is about. Right? But it's also good for people who, who want to grow more in their faith to study the statement of faith. In fact, I don't know if you realize it or not, but our statement of faith at the back table not only has clear statements about certain doctrinal issues, but it also provides the scriptures that each one of those things is based on. Everything that it says is backed up by, by the scriptures. And I would encourage you to take those and actually read that and grow in your understanding of your faith. I would also encourage you to read and understand the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed. You don't need to memorize those things, but I promise you, you read those things, you go, wait a minute, we talk about that kind of stuff all the time. That makes it really, really clear. These are the great Christian creeds that have been handed down to us over the centuries, and they will help you to understand what you believe even better as a church. And I would even encourage you to get a copy of the 1689 Second London Baptist Confession of Faith and read it. It's a wonderful confession that helps to connect us to our Baptist heritage during the Reformation era, but it also is rich enough that it will challenge you to grow in your knowledge and understanding of your faith. And if you need a copy, you let me know. I'll order some more, get you one. So why is all this important? I mean, why are we, you know, finishing up the the, the new the, the old year and beginning the new year? With this, I mean, why do we interrupt our walk through the Gospel of Mark to talk about this for a couple of weeks? Well, the truth simply is this. We need to do what we need to do to be the church that God is calling us to be so we can live the way God is calling us to live. We need to be the pillar in the ground of the truth, which means we need to get certain things right. The truth right, the, member, the leadership right, and the membership of the church right. Because, because here are the facts, okay? You know I love this church. But over the decades, our church, historically speaking, at times has kind of wandered and swerved in different directions theologically. Right? And, and the truth is that there have been times, there have been unqualified people that have had leadership positions in the church. I'm not saying that any of the pastors were unqualified. I'm saying that there have been people who have had great influence in the church that just simply were not qualified to do so. There have been members of the church that had great, great influence in the affairs of First Baptist Church and the direction that it was going that, that just had no business really having that kind of leadership. They were unqualified for that. And the church at times has taught some things that are not exactly biblical. I'm not, I'm not saying that the church has taught outright heresy, but there are some things I can look back through the history and say, that's not really what the Bible actually teaches. Right? 
Now, believe me, I'm not casting stones because I love this church and love the history of, of the faithfulness of our church. But it is the grace of God. It is the grace of God that has kept us from ending up like so many churches in the world today. It is the grace of God. I mean, there is a church, a prominent church, where the pastor's wife just publicly celebrated that her daughter, 12 years old, that is now identifying as a boy, is getting an implant to block hormones. The pastor's wife and the, the pastor and the church are celebrating this as, as good. Right? There is another church that ordained that ordained a lesbian as the pastor of the church. Right? I, I mean, and I say that to say is they didn't start off that way, right? These were churches that have have deep theological roots, but over time begin to slowly drift and they compromised on these things, the truth, the leadership, and the membership. By the grace of God himself, our church family here has a high view of God. By the grace of God himself, we have a high view of Scripture. By the grace of God, we have a clear statement of faith. And by the grace of God, we have a growing understanding within our congregation of the theology of who God is. And I believe with all my heart that our church is growing in the right direction. I've said multiple times, it is not my desire to see numbers. My desire is to see growth in maturity in the faith of our church. And so, but in order for us to continue to grow as a church in the right direction, and in order for us to ensure this church remains faithful for years and generations to come, as long as the Lord tarries, there are three things that need to happen here at First Baptist Church. Number one, we as a church need to grow in our understanding of the doctrine of the church and its mission. All of us, I'm not asking you guys to have degrees in theology. Praise the Lord for that, right? But we all need to have an understanding of what the church is, what the church's mission is. We all need to have a picture of what we're doing here together. All of us need to understand what we're doing and what, what Christ is asking for us. And we also all need to be able to, to know how God wants his church run. What does worship look like? What does is, what, what is proper handling of the word look like? How do, how does, what does proper fellowship look like? We all need to have a clear theology of the church. Secondly, we need to make some adjustments to our church's leadership structure so that the church isn't susceptible to radical theological shifts in the event that leaders in the church change. Now, please, I want you to hear me on this. Okay, I ain't hinting, hinting about nothing. Right? I'm not suggesting anything. Right? Please understand. Right? I have no plans at all to go anywhere. I'm not even thinking about anything else. I'm not looking at anything else. I am here as long as God has me here. So please, every once in a while, I'll say something in the message. Somebody goes, are you going somewhere? Like, no. Okay? I will tell you. All right? All right? I have no plans to go anywhere. But I do know something. That I'm not God. And that life happens. Right? And, and the fact of the matter is, is none of us can say right now how much time we have left. Not a one of us can say that we're going to have tomorrow. Not even me. All right? And because of that, we need to put things in place so that the church carries on in a faithful direction no matter what happens to any of us. Because here's the thing, the pressure on the church from the outside culture to capitulate is only going to get greater. We need to make sure that the leadership in this church continues on in the same direction. Number three, our church needs to develop future leaders. One of, the, one of the troubles has been for our church is that our leaders have always come from the outside, and we've done well with that at times, and sometimes not quite so well. And, and, and so what we need to do is we need to develop the future leaders of this church, not just people who serve, that's important, and not just deacons who meet practical needs, super important, but we need theological leaders, future pastors, future elders, future missionaries that we can send out into the world, future church planters that are all qualified to lead. The church is not doing what it's supposed to do if we're not training up another generation of leaders right here at First Baptist Church. That's a part of the mission. This church needs to be training up the next generation of leaders so the First Baptist Church continues to fulfill its mission for years to come. 
Because our community still needs Jesus and will continue to do so, which means our community still needs First Baptist Church and will continue to do so. Now, before I pray for you and dismiss you, I want to encourage you um, (laughs) by giving you some homework. (laughs) Uh, This week, what I want you to do is, um, is take some time and actually get into the Word and read through First and Second Timothy and Titus. And when you do, I want you to pay attention to the emphasis on teaching and doctrine and confession and the Word of God. You will see patterns emerging there. And I also want you to notice what it says about the church and church leaders, because we're going to talk about more of that next week. All right, this right here is how you begin to really kind of absorb. Now you have a focus on what the Word of God has to say for you. Because... Church family, you're the church. (laughs) We're the church. And if we're going to do what God is calling us to do, if we're going to reach the people that God's calling us to reach, then we need to be the people God's calling us to be. We are the family of God that protect and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is who we are. That is what we do. Let me pray for you. You've been listening to the preaching ministry of Pastor Sherman Burkhead, a production of First Baptist Church in Boron, California. Our website address is fbcboron.org. And would you please consider partnering with us financially as we work to share the hope and the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and our world.